Welcome to ICU Primary Prepcast. Hi, I'm Mary. Hi, I'm Swapnil. And today we are going to talk about blood products and its implication to ICU. Are you ready? Yeah. Can you briefly outline the main components of blood? Sure. So approximately 8% of an adult's total body weight is made up of blood, which is 5 or 6 litres in men and about 4 to 5 litres in women. Blood consists of cellular elements. These are red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets, which are suspended in a protein-rich fluid called plasma. Plasma comprises about 55% of total blood volume. The red blood cells are biconcave discs with no nucleus that transport both oxygen via hemoglobin and carbon dioxide. Red blood cells have a lifespan of about 120 days in the circulation. White blood cells are present at a concentration of between 4,000 to 11,000 cells per microliter in blood. They consist of granulocytes, which are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and agranulocytes, which are lymphocytes and monocytes, and they are a vital part of the immune system. Platelets are small disc-shaped granulated cell bodies without a nucleus, whose main function is the formation of a platelet plug and activation of hemostatic mechanisms in response to vascular injury. The plasma consists of about 92% water, 7% protein, and 1% small dissolved solutes such as ions, urea, amino acids, and glucose. The principal cation is sodium, which is present at a concentration of about 140 millimoles per litre. Other important cations include potassium, calcium, and magnesium. The plasma concentration of ions are almost the same as that of the interstitial fluid due to the permeability of capillaries. However, these capillaries are impermeable to plasma proteins, resulting in a colloid osmotic pressure gradient. The total plasma protein concentration is 60 to 80 grams per litre and consists of albumin, globulins, complement and fibrinogen. Blood as a whole has three main functions. Transport, including gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients, waste products, hormones, and heat. Protection, such as with white blood cells, antibodies, coagulation factors, and platelets. And regulation, including that of pH, water balance, and electrolytes. Okay, can you please list the adverse effects of blood transfusion? So the adverse effects of blood transfusion can be divided into immunological and non-immunological effects. Immunological effects can be further subdivided into acute effects and delayed effects. Acute effects include hemolysis, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions, allergic reactions which can be mild or severe, and transfusion-related acute lung injury. Delayed immunological effects include delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, post-transfusion purpura, transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease, alloimmunization, and transfusion-related immune modulation. Non-immunological adverse effects can also be subdivided into acute and delayed effects. Acute effects include non-immune-mediated hemolysis, bacterial infection, and transfusion-associated circulatory overload. Delayed effects include iron overload and transfusion-transmissible infections, such as hepatitis and HIV. Let's take a clinical scenario. 30-year-old young adult who came to emergency department after sustaining a polytrauma and currently is in hypovolemic shock and ED doctor has activated massive transfusion. Can you please define massive transfusion and list its side effects? Massive transfusion is a transfusion of volume of stored blood greater than the recipient's blood volume in less than 24 hours or half of their volume of blood within four hours. Most institutions have a specific massive transfusion protocol. In addition to the baseline risk of blood transfusion, massive transfusion also has several specific complications, which include metabolic, hematological, and cardiorespiratory effects. Metabolic effects include citrate toxicity and hypocalcemia, which often can occur if the transfusion rate is greater than 1 litre per 10 minutes or when an exchange transfusion is carried out within 2 hours. Other metabolic effects include hyperkalemia, 
as potassium can leak from the restored red blood cells. And normally, this potassium diffuses into the cells and does not cause issues. But if the patient is hyperkalemic or persistently acidotic or hypotensive, as in the case of a polytrauma patient, hyperkalemia can become an issue. Other metabolic effects include hypomagnesemia, acidosis, as stored blood progressively becomes acidotic with a pH of 6.5 to 6.8 after two weeks, and that massive transfusion can increase this acidosis in recipients. And finally, hypothermia because transfusion of cold blood can cause this hypothermia. Therefore, in massive transfusions, blood should always be put on a fluid warmer. Hematological adverse effects include 2,3 DPG deficiency, as during storage, the 2,3 DPG concentration in red blood cells decreases. This can cause decreased oxygen delivery as the hemoglobin oxygen disassociation curve shifts to the left. Other hematological effects include dilutional coagulopathy, as stored blood has low levels of factor 5, 8, and 9. Factor 5 and 8 are known as labile factors, and, and their levels decrease the most quickly in stored blood. Dilutional coagulopathy is most likely to occur if more than double the blood volume is replaced in 24 hours. The platelets in stored blood are also reduced and dysfunctional, which can cause a dilutional thrombocytopenia and exacerbate this coagulopathy. The final hematological effect of massive transfusion can include microaggregates, which consists of clumps of fibrin, platelets, and leukocytes, which are formed in stored blood. These can enter the circulation and become trapped in pulmonary vessels, releasing lysosomes and causing ARDS. Finally, cardiorespiratory adverse effects of massive transfusion include a higher incidence of transfusion-related acute lung injury and transfusion-associated circulatory. Okay, let's move into individual component of massive transfusion now. Can you please describe the pharmacology of packed red blood cells? So the pharmacology of packed red blood cells can be divided into the pharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. In terms of the pharmaceutics, packed red blood cells are obtained by removing approximately 200 to 250 mils of plasma after centrifuging one unit of whole blood that's collected in the anticoagulant citrate. This results in a final volume of approximately 250 mils per unit of blood. This is then resuspended with additives such as phosphate and dextrose, or with saline, adenine, glucose and mannitol as a preservative. The red cells are filtered to remove most of the leukocytes in order to reduce the risk of adverse reactions. The hematocrit of packed red blood cells is approximately 0.7 and the pH is 7.12 at collection but drops to 6.8 during storage. Red cells must be stored at 2 to 6 degrees which reduces the risk of bacterial contamination and they have a shelf life of 42 days. However, after two to three weeks, they start to undergo structural and functional changes termed storage lesions. These changes include decreased 2,3 DPG and ATP levels, decreased deformability of erythrocytes, hemolysis and release of free hemoglobin, accumulation of potassium, lactate and pro-inflammatory molecules, all of which may theoretically reduce the oxygen carrying capacity and increase inflammation. However, the clinical significance of this is controversial. Indications for transfusion of packed red blood cells are symptomatic anemia and uncontrolled bleeding. The hemoglobin targets for transfusion vary from institution to institution, but are generally less than 70 grams per litre in adults. The pharmacokinetics can be divided into administration, distribution, metabolism and elimination. Packed cells are administered intravenously and distribute within the intravascular compartment. They are not metabolized but are eliminated by the spleen and liver and implied to some extent by the bone marrow. As red blood cells age, they are less able to generate ATP by the anaerobic glycolytic pathway. This is required to maintain red blood cell shape and integrity. The old red blood cells are removed in the spleen and bone marrow by macrophages and in the liver by cryptocell. The globin is metabolized into amino acids that can be recycled for protein synthesis, while the heme is degraded into biliverdin and iron. 
the biliverdin is converted to bilirubin, which is conjugated in the liver, and the iron is reutilized for hemoglobin synthesis. In terms of the pharmacodynamics, one unit of packed red blood cells generally increases the hemoglobin concentration by 10 grams per litre. Transfusing packed red blood cells mainly aims to increase the oxygen carrying capacity and or to increase intravascular volume in the bleeding patient. The risk of blood transfusion have already been outlined. Okay, before we usually transfuse any patient, we do group and uh, cross match. Can you please explain the ABO and rhesus blood group system? So red cell membranes contain a variety of antigens, but the most important of which are the A and B antigens followed by the rhesus antigen. ABO antigens are controlled by three allelic genes, A, B, and O, which are on two paired chromosomes. Each parent donates one of two ABO genes to their child, with the A and B genes being dominant, and the O gene being recessive. Individuals are divided into four major blood types depending on the antigens present. Type A have the A antigen, type B have the B antigen, type AB have both A and B antigen, and type O have neither. All individuals have a core or H antigen, which is a glycoprotein precursor with one fucose as a terminal sugar. Those with the A antigen have N-acetylgalactosamine added to this terminal group of the H antigen, while those with B antigen have a D-galactose added. Those who are type AB therefore have both the N-acetylgalactosamine and D-galactose added, whereas type O have neither and just has the core H antigen. Antibodies against these red cell antigens are known as agglutinins and are formed early in life against the antigens not present in the body. This antibody formation occurs without the need for exposure to ABO-incompatible blood. Therefore, people with type A blood have anti-B antibodies, type B individuals have anti-A antibodies, and so on. Consequently, people with type AB blood are universal recipients as they have no circulating agglutinins or antibodies, while those with type O are universal donors as they have no A or B antigens on the red blood cells. Type O is the most common blood type with a prevalence of approximately 40%, followed by type A at 41%, B at 9%, and AB being the least common at 3%. The rhesus blood group system actually consists of 61 different antigens. However, the most important are C, D, and E. The C and E are of two different antigen types, connotated by upper and lowercase. There is only an uppercase D antigen, the lowercase d just denoting the absence of the D antigen. This D antigen is the most antigenic and is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and present in over 90% of the population. When the capital D antigen is present, individuals are termed rhesus positive. Unlike ABO antigens, rhesus antigens are only present in red blood cells, and rhesus negative individuals require exposure to rhesus positive blood in order to develop antibodies. And how is blood tested for compatibility using the ABO system? So, blood typing is done in three steps forward typing, reverse typing, and type D typing. ABO forward typing is used to detect the presence or absence of A and or B antigens on an individual's red blood cells in order to determine the ABO group. This is very important in, to ensure that ABO compatible blood is transfused. An individual's red blood cells are added to a reagent with anti-A and one reagent with anti-B sera. If both of these reagents agglutinate or clump, then their blood type is AB. However, if neither agglutinate, then they are type O, and so on. Reverse typing is then performed to detect ABO antibodies in an individual serum, and thus confer the result from the forward typing. In reverse typing, the patient's serum is mixed with a reagent containing type A cells, and one containing type B cells. Type AB individuals will not agglutinate in either reagent, as they have both A and B antigens on their cells whilst type O individuals will agglutinate in both. 
D-typing is then performed by adding the patient's red cells to anti-D. If there is no agglutination, then the patient is rhesus negative, whereas if there is agglutination, they are rhesus positive. After blood is typed, an antibody screen is done using the patient's plasma. The plasma is to te tested against screening cells containing the most common clinically significant non-ABO antigens. Following this, a cross-match is done, which can be electronic if the patient has no clinically significant antibodies, or can be serological. Serological cross-match is where the donor blood is tested for compatibility with the recipient's blood. This consists of the saline test, where donor red blood cells are mixed with the recipient's plasma and some saline, and then observed for clumping or, or agglutination. This detects the presence of IgM antibodies. Following this, the indirect Coombs test is performed, where the recipient serum and donor blood cells are washed to remove all serum and any unbound IgG still present. Coombs reagent, which contains antibodies against these IgG antibodies, that is anti-IgG IgG, is added, which should bind to any IgG that is bound to red cells. This will appear macroscopically as agglutination and is a positive Coombs test. If the test is negative, a control test is done by adding red cells known to be coated with IgG to the negative solution. If the reagent is active, agglutination should now result. Now let's move on to the other components of massive transfusion. Can you briefly outline the properties of transfused platelets, fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate and the indications of their transfusion? So platelets are collected either as pooled or apheresis platelets. Pooled platelets are derived from whole blood obtained from a pool of buffy coats, that is the fraction of anticoagulated blood that contains most of the white blood cells and platelets after centrifuging blood, obtained from four ABO identical donors and resuspended in additives. Apheresis platelets are obtained by separating blood into components using an apheresis machine retaining the platelets and a part of the plasma and returning the rest back to the donor. Platelets are all then leukodepleted and irradiated in the blood bank. They are stored at 20 to 24 degrees Celsius, continually gently agitated and have a shelf life of five days. They are indicated for two broad scenarios, patients with bleeding and as prophylaxis against bleeding. Indications in patients with bleeding include those where thrombocytopenia is thought to be a major contributing factor, critical bleeding requiring massive transfusion, acquired or congenital functional platelet defects such as, the, such as in those patients on antiplatelet agents. Indications for prophylaxis include severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of less than 10 by 10 to the 9 per litre or to maintain a platelet count above 50 times 10 to the 9 per litre in those undergoing invasive procedures or surgery. One pooled platelet is expected to increase the platelet count by 20 to 40 by 10 to the 9 per litre. FFP is collected from either whole blood, which is separated, or from apheresis plasma, and then frozen to below negative 30 degrees. FFP contains all the coagulation factors and can be stored for 12 months at minus 25 degrees or less. Once it is defrosted, it needs to be used within four hours. The indications for FFP include treatment of coagulation deficiencies associated with coagulopathies, including DIC, liver disease, trauma, massive transfusion or cardiac bypass, or for reversal of warfarin where there is life-threatening ble bleeding, or for replacement of single factor deficiencies where specific factor concentrates are unavailable. Finally, cryoprecipitate is obtained by thawing FFP between 1 to 6 degrees, recovering the precipitate and then refreezing it. Cryoprecipitate contains factor 8, fibrinogen, factor 13, von Willebrand factor and fibronectin. It can be stored for 12 months at minus 25 degrees. One unit of whole blood derived cryoprecipitate for 5 to 10 kilogram body weight would be expected to increase the fibrinogen by 0.5 to 1 gram per litre, whilst one unit of apheresis derived cryoprecipitate would increase it by about twice this amount. 
prior precipitate is used for the treatment of fibrinogen deficiency or dysfibrinogenemia in the setting of bleeding, trauma, DIC, or in an invasive procedure. What factor concentrates are available and what are their indications? There are several factor concentrates currently available, including recombinant activated factor 7, factor 8, factor 9, prothrombin X, and human antithrombin thrombin 3. Recombinant activated factor 7 is approved for the prevention and control of bleeding in patients with inhibitors to factor 8 or 9, those with congenital factor 7 deficiency, and those with Glanzmann's thromboacetinemia. It is also used off-label in life-threatening hemorrhage. Factor 8 is used to control and prevent bleeding in patients with haemophilia A. Factor 8 is also available in combination with von, Will von Willebrand factor and is used in patients with von Willebrand disease. Factor 9 is used for the treatment of bleeding and as prophylaxis in patients with haemophilia B. Prothrombin X is a concentrate of human coagulation factors 2, 9 and 10 with a small amount of factor 7. It is used for the prophylaxis and treatment of bleeding in patients with deficiencies of factor 2 or 10 or for the reversal of vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin. Finally, human antithrombin 3 is used in the treatment of patients with inherited deficiency of antithrombin 3 and is also sometimes used in cases of acquired antithrombin deficiency such as liver disease or DIC. Okay, now I can see that you're wearing the nice Christmas outfit and I can see there's a question in your eyes. Yep, so I thought because we're coming up to Christmas and we're going to take a break over the Christmas season, we should end with a little Christmas joke. Okay, I tried my best throughout this year, but I'll try again. I, I hope Santa will give me some help and I can get this question right. Okay. Shoot. So why does Santa refuse to go down the chimney? Oh my goodness. Maybe he can't fit in the chimney? No. Or this too smoky? Uh, good try. Because he gets claustrophobic. <laughs> oh, Maddie, again, I, I hope this the new year will bring me some more IQ and I can answer your questions in better fashion. Uh, folks, uh, this is our last podcast of the year and I hope you enjoyed the series. Uh, we'll be back in the next year. Till then, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.